Right, okay, so we're coming towards the end of this now, so we've got stone tomorrow to finish these things off. So what I want to do today is to, uh, is to talk about some of the final bits of this Java swing stuff, and then at the end we'll spend a few minutes talking about the second assessment, which has just been set. So, what I want to, uh, oops, it's not that. Um, so I'm here. Um, so, so to summarise where we're at with this. So, we've had a look at some of these things. I think the, there's a danger that this is just going to turn into a bit of a uh, listing all the things that are, that are available. I'll try and say a bit about, about some of these, tie it in with some other topics. So, this is trying to summarise what's, what's there in, in, in terms of swing interface components. So, we've seen quite a lot of these things already. So. We've got notions of labels, just pieces of text that don't interact with the user. So you used to display text in parts of an interface. And then we've got notions of buttons. So we've seen how to implement single buttons, but there are also other components. So there are, there are things like checkboxes where you've got a number of uh, a number of a number of choices, radio buttons where you want to make one choice from a, a list of things. And then we've seen text fields for inputting short pieces of text. There's also another thing called a text area, which is uh, basically designed to hold more text and tie in with the whole thing about scrolling and creating an area that can be, can be scrollable as well. And there are these things to do with choosing from a list, the drop down lists that you see for particularly for menus and things like that, but also in other, other areas. Uh, there, are, there are things that allow you to make a choice again, choice of things this, choice of combinations of things. And then there are these things called spinners, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, which are ways of, of inputting this particular range of numbers or pieces of text and sliders that allow you to choose from a range. So let's have a think about this. And what, one way to think about this is to think that some of these basic types, these primitive types and these collection types um, <coughs> fit well with some of the, the, the uh, interface elements in, uh, in, in Swing. So you know, we might think about Booleans being matched to checkboxes, either you tick the box or you don't. You might think about enumerations and various different kinds of collection sets fitting with certain kinds of user elements. And then numbers having things. So you might think about a number and you know, do you want to use just a, a sliding thing? Do you want to use one of these things called a spinner, which is where you choose from a list of a long list of numbers, or do you want to allow people to put that in as a as a text field? And remember that you can you can use these formatted text fields. So if we think back to the last class assignment, you had this idea that you could specify what format you wanted the, the text to fit to. So similarly, you know, if you want something more specialised, so say you want to specify the date, so you know, 1st of November 2012, you could
could, again, use these spinners, these things that allow you to choose from one of a number of, of options, for day, month, and year. Could have formatted text. Increasingly popular, you see these little pop-up calendar things, and, and there, are, there are things available to do that kind of thing. And similarly, with strings, there's basically a choice between text fields, which are short, single line pieces of text, and the text area. And I suppose that the main difference is there is that the text field is designed to be something where you type a line of text, a short piece of text, and then you press return. And having pressed return, that, that creates an event that can be. Uh, be acted on directly, whereas the text area is designed for larger pieces of text. And the idea there is that you, you put the text in, you can put returns and paragraphs in it, you can create a, a scrollable area so that you can, you can have a, a box on the screen and if you want to type a lot of text it will scroll up and down. And then the, the you know, that will need to be tied in with some kind of button or something to, to put the information in there. So this is about sort of storing information, you know, what do these different kinds of information ne um, need in terms of the, the, uh, the interface. And I suppose to pull back from the specifics to the more general, there's various notions about how these things are designed and one of these is this this model view controller idea so um it's about the broad design of, of, of programs that have an interface and so when we think about uh when we think about having a user interface we've got some kind of view that the user sees. So we've got some notion of um, you know, a window with, with menu elements and boxes and text and so on. And then behind that there's some kind of there's some kind of program that's doing what's often called the application logic of the of the of the program. And then even further behind that, we might say we've got some kind of uh, data. So we've got a, the idea of you know, this kind of model view controller idea, which you see, and there's variants on this. This is just one, one kind of one version of this, is that you've got a separation of concerns. You've got things that are you know, objects that are principally concerned with storing the information. So, you know, one of the fundamental ideas about object-oriented programming is that you create a number of classes that store the information that's relevant to the application. And that they've got certain handles, certain methods that allow another program to control those, how that data gets put in and put out. So ideally, you know, there's a notion that you want to separate these things out, that you want a sort of data model, and then you want the, the program, and you know, here's where we think about things like this main program and so on. Ideally, what we want to be doing there is dealing with quite high level things about the data. So you want this controller to be about the, the core way in which the system works and then the details of how the data is manipulated is through the, uh, the, uh, the uh, interfaces, through the methods in the, in the objects that are in the model. So that's one separation of concerns. And then finally, you've got this notion of a link between the controller and the view. So you've got some idea that 
you might have certain actions here, and rather than tying that in within the same class, you've got some kind of hooks out from here, some kind of methods out from here that connect into uh, a graphical user interface. So you don't want to be tying the details of the elements in the interface too closely into here. And one of the ideas here is that is, is that then of substitutability is the idea that if we want a very different view, then we can, you know, we can create a different kind of interface to the same information without changing the underlying application logic that's going on in, in the controller or the way the data is represented has, you know, perhaps similarly at this level as well, though this isn't, this isn't something we're so concerned about at the moment. You might think about the idea of having different views of the same program. So you might have the idea that you've got some kind of fundamental description of how the application works, what steps are taken, and you create one view that's a web-based interface, one view that is a Java application, one view that's a, a mobile application in some, some form. So there's a sort of notion about design here, which is, which is useful. So that's sort of a little uh, diversion into some more general aspects of design for this kind of thing. So, you know, we might have some notion of um, the model for a concept like a date so that can store a day, a month, and a year. So you might have methods that are just direct methods to access the information. Maybe that's a good idea or not. Probably is in this case. But you might have other methods to modify it. So rather than just saying, um, you know, you can access the day, the month, and the year directly, you might have a method like move on to the next day. And then you could, you could have that that model and then via various combinations of controller and view you could you could view it in different ways so you might in one application want to have text boxes for day month and year and then you or you might want to have a, a month thing you see this quite often you see a, a month displayed current month and then you can shuffle through the months and the current day is highlighted and these are essentially two different things. One's about the user interface, and one is about the um, one is about how the thing's represented. So it might have something here, it might be a calendar, so it might say 2012, then November, not the month, it's the fourth day. This might be something that's more text based. Well, something like that. And then essentially the graphical user interface code that's in these classes is linking to something which says, you know, choose date in here, which in turn is then linking back to the uh, actual representation, the actual class, the objects of the class date in there. So you might say, you know, perhaps you're booking a flight or something, and it says when do you want to fly, and so you, you, know, you choose that, that sets it there, and that modifies a, an object there. So, so probably something like middleware of the model and the view? I think that's a very reasonable view, yeah, yeah. I mean, essentially, when you, I mean, one way to think about this, which is simple, but quite effective, to think about um, this as representing 
what all these these elements allow you to do. So when you think about your writing these responses to action to form and so on, um, you know, perhaps you can encapsulate all that there. Similarly, if you have a main method that sets things up, that seems to sit here. Yeah? You, you say the first thing to do is to create a number of a number of objects and then you wait for user responses. And that's all in what's sometimes called the application logic of the thing, yeah. The the rules that are telling you how a particular pro you know, how particular what the program's actually doing. And then these are essentially just kind of static things, the classes in here. These are just kind of things not static in the technical sense, not in, in the job sense. In the sense that, that, that they're not they're not doing anything particularly complicated. They're just sort of storing information, but storing information in a way that's structured and allows yeah certain things to be done to them. So this is more about the sort of flow of activity, it's about the storage of information. And this is about what the user sees. And we can also think about substitutability here. So we might think that the same application. You know, initially, these storage, this storage might just be some kind of <coughs> collection of Java objects. So, you know, if you've got a very simple, small scale application, you might be saying that this is just a program that's running and this is a collection of, of objects that are, are rendering that program. But then you want to make that program run on a larger scale. You want to make it run over you know, days or weeks or months or years, or you want it to scale up in terms of size. So you don't want to store a few dozen objects, you want to store a few thousand or a few million. So suddenly having a, pro a single instance of that program running and everything just being stored as objects suddenly becomes very vulnerable. So. You know, again, you could substitute here, and you could think that after you've got a prototype going, you've got a separate model, which is, you know, perhaps a more persistent storage of database or some kind of writing of these objects. You know, more crudely, some of these things that write objects to files regularly or something. So, by separating out these different concerns, you've got a certain way of reorganizing the storage of uh, the data. So that's you know that that's some sort of some sort of design ideas around around that kind of thing. And so let's sort of get back to some detail again. So again, another list of, of stuff. Or was a um, an attendance sheet here. So talked a little bit about some of this already. So you've seen these text fields, yeah. So these text fields basically have a line. You can put text in. There's a font associated with them, which you can change. And that's useful for inputting a simple piece of text. So you might put in your name or something like that. And you press return at the end, and it does something in response to that. There's another example, a very a more specialised example, but one that's obviously used quite commonly, which is, 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 a, is, a, is a password field, which is similar to the text field, but it doesn't print the output on the, on the screen. So um, you've seen these, you've used these in the exercises in the class. And there's a text area, and the idea of that is that there are multiple lines. So you've got a, a, a text area with a specific font associated with it. But now you can put in multiple lines of text, you can put in returns to make paragraphs and so on. And, and so you can, you can do that. There's also then, as you get more sophisticated, there are things called editor panes and text panes, which allow you to display things like HTML and use different fonts and styles and colors. So they're sort of for more sophisticated text. And then the thing that you've also seen, I think, or seen some variant on, which is a format of text field, where you say, I'm only going to allow input in a certain, a certain format. 
So you might only allow things of a certain length, or you might restrict things to being being numbers or uh, or um, or whatever, depending on what information you want to put in. And if you're doing more sophisticated things here, there's um there's an object called a document, which basically underlines the, uh, underlies these things. If you're just using these text fields and text areas, then this is less relevant. But if you want to either modify the text field or you want to do something um, more sophisticated with the, the, the more advanced ones, then, then it's worth looking at this thing called document and seeing how that works. And that's you know, got some stuff about these things about restricting the kind of data that's entered and, and so on. So there's, there's stuff there about text. I think I've said this as we've gone along. We've seen text fields, but then we've got text areas here, text boxes which have multi lines. You create it with a certain number of columns and rows. And then this grows automatically if you type past the end. So it needs to go into something called a scroll pane. So that's that's a thing that can have a scroll bar associated with it. So there's 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 an idea of something where you can have one of these things that allows you to scroll up and down on the side. And interestingly, this doesn't generate action events. So the text field that you saw in the last class or the last couple of classes, they relied on action events. If you think about that converter program, so you had the miles to kilometers converter, that worked when you pressed return. Yeah, you filled in a number in the text field in the uh, format of text field, and that so when you pressed return, that made the conversion from miles to kilometers or, or vice versa. In this case, it doesn't generate any kind of action event. So how, how do you do anything with it? Well, this comes back to a principle that we talked about the other week, which is that not everything in a user interface has to have listeners associated with it, has to have a actions associated with it, yeah. So you might have a, you know, if we imagine this being slightly different, you might say that's a text field there. And then there's a button. So you might have one of these text areas, and then there's a button down there. So you fill out the text there, and you press a button to input that text. I'm sure you've all seen this in different kinds of interfaces to things. So that's these, these text areas. And then there are also things to do with lists. So there's different kinds of, of lists that present a number of items to choose from. So there's different things of these. And particularly, <coughs> there's different modes of selection that you can allow in, in these sorts of things. So you can allow just one item to be selected. You can allow a group of items to be selected. Or you can have various items being selected in combination. And so you've got this. I'll show you an image in a minute. And again, this is something that ties in with the notion of scrolling. So you've got this idea of a scroll pane, which is a, 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 an element which allows you to, to have a scroll bar up and down the side of it. And so if you've got a longer list, I need to go in there. So here's some examples. So you might have a list like that, and there's your scroll bar there. There's a slightly different, different one there. And there's these different kinds of selections. So you can make a selection of a single one. You can make a selection of a number of things in an interval contiguously. Or you can make a selection of different things from the list. And there are, there are, there are details of methods that allow you to choose, you know, to, 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 to make one of these lists available and, and get, the, get the information back from them. So this is another common element you see in interfaces. And then you've got these drop-down boxes. So what happens here? Well, there you've got, you've got a thing there. 
So it's the most common, this is all about date and time formats, isn't it? Um, you know, how, how do you want to display the date and time? But you see these very commonly in things like selecting from a list of countries or something like that. You know, what's, what's the, uh, you know, what's your, your country? And you have to scroll down the bottom to find the United Kingdom or something. And uh, so, so you see these sort of elements here. And again, this is about selecting one from a list of alternatives. So there's an idea of a text field there, and, and you might be able to type into that text field, and then there's a list of alternatives. So you might be able to, to narrow it down in that way. And how does that link into the, you know, what's this link here? Well, it's to do with when an item's selected. So whenever you scroll down and stop and let go of it at a particular item, that's when that item's selected. So you let go of that element, it fills it in in the text field, and then that generates an action event which allows you to react to that if you want to react to it at that point and change, you know, change some of the data in the program. And then... There's a notion of a slider, so there's various ideas to do with um, choosing from a range of numbers, yeah? So you've got some idea of a, a kind of slider component, you can think of as a kind of range of numbers, you know, it might be three out to a hundred or something, and you can move an element across, so this allows you to so it's one way of choosing numbers, yeah? So what happens is that you've got a class called J slider, and then you set the limits of this. So you say what it means at one end and at the other end. And then when that slider gets moved, when the user changes the value there, that generates something called change events. There's lots of there's lots of technical detail about all these different kinds of events that are generated. And so rather than action events, this generates something called change events, which I don't know. I don't, I don't know why it's as complicated as this. I, there must be technical reasons for this, but uh, uh, you know, you basically have something called a change listener rather than an action listener to pick up on these these things. So if you do that, you can you can generate integers and then, you know, if you want to control a smaller value, so say you wanted a value between 0 and 1, you could have the underlying thing being between 0 and 100 and then cast that into a, a double or a float and then divide it down to get an appropriate value. You can configure the labels and where they appear and create tick marks on it. And as with all these things, there's, 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 there's nice things, nice examples in this online tutorial, this Oracle tutorial. So, and another thing that I've talked about once or twice here is this idea of a spinner. So there's something called JSpinner, and that allows you to create things like this. So here's a, here's a thing, you, you can, you've got little, you've got little, arrows that allow you to go up and down, so the month, click on one arrow, it'll go January, February, March, April, May, and so on. Um, alternatively, you could input from the keyboard, as, as before, as similar to those combo boxes. So you see these in things where you've got, again, where you've got a number of alternatives. And I suspect particularly when the alternatives are, are ordered in some way, so you want to step through the years or the months. So this is quite a, you know, another quite common element here that you see. And these have quite an interesting structure behind them. So what's happening? Well, to create one of these, you create something called a, a J spinner. Create a JSON, so to create a JSON, you, you create one of these things called a spinner model. And that tells you something about how what's displayed in the box changes when you press the buttons. It generates these change events again. So if 
you want to respond to a value being changed directly rather than pressing a button, you can do that. I think often it's going to depend entirely on the application, of course, but quite commonly responding to these things might not be the best way of doing it. You may be better you know, having something which you check in with a single button, but I'm sure there are applications where responding directly to these things is, is useful. And then that spinner model, that thing that describes in the sense the underlying logic underneath that user element then gets passed to a, to a constructor for the, for the spinner. And this you know, some details there. The spinner model, which is an interface which is um, implemented, it's partially implemented by an abstract thing called an abstract spinner model. And particularly there are a number of things that are built in. So there are things like spinner date model, spinner number model, spinner list model. So date is obviously for dealing with dates, numbers to deal with ranges of, of numbers, and lists to interact with a, a Java list style collection to allow you to choose from, from, a, from a list in that, that sense of the word. So, if you want to, uh, you know, want to look at an example, then we can think about the number model. So this is a specific kind of spinner that you can use, and when you initialize it, it you, you have an initial value, and then you have minimum, maximum, and step size as the parameters. So let's say we're talking about day of the week, we might initialize it to, to one, and then we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for the you know, so the minimum is one, the maximum is seven, the step size is one. You can also do this with doubles, so you can have floating point numbers in there. And then if you want to access it, there's a get number method, and that returns something called a number. And a number is essentially an abstraction of ints and doubles. So a number object could hold either an integer or a floating point value, a decimal value, and there are methods within the within that to extract the there's a single value in a number object, but you can extract that either as, a, as an int, primitive type int, or a primitive type double. Um, and you know, then you might think about how are these things created, how are these spinner things created, these spinner models created. Well, you do it by extending this thing to the abstract spin model. And basically that means you have to override four of these, these objects, four of these methods. So there's one that is about how you get the value, how do you get information out of it, how do you set the value, so how do you initialize it. You might initialize it in the constructor, but you might also want to change that initialization elsewhere. Um, and then how do you get the next and previous values? So what that means is when you've got these little arrows, what happens when you uh, go up or down there? How does, that, how does that change the value that's displayed there? And therefore the value that you get when you call get value or whatever bespoke method you write to get access to that value. So that's all about that. And can you connect the spinner model with uh, maybe a shape? So you can press the arrow down and change shapes, shapes for example? I don't know about that. Uh, if you use, and that's why you use this, um, we implement this. So rather, so rather than being text, it's a shape. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it has, I, I'm not, I'm not sure, I think it has to be some kind of text representation, but perhaps there's a way of doing it, I'm not too sure. So the idea is you'd have, say, a number of pictures in there, yeah. I don't know whether you can do that in this way, it might be possible. Um, I, I don't know whether you can do it directly, you may have to go even more further up and, and look at the spinner model and, and so change that. In those situations you use, you, you have to write your own spinner model. Why? Uh, are the spinner? Oh, sorry. 
I think the idea here would be, I mean, I think a lot of the time you'd, you'd you know, you'd be, you'd be using one of the ones that's, that's here, like these, but you might, you know, you might want to have, for, um, you know, a different, sorry? You may want to have a multiple uh, things inside, maybe a date with numbers and... Yeah, you might, you might want to specialise, you can specialise that, you may want to, you know, I mean a lot of these can be dealt with by either list or by, um, by number, but, you know, in lesson theory it could be, it could be something else. Um, this is very generic, this is a list model, that allows you to basically put in a list of, of things and choose from that list, which is uh, kind of generic, but I can't think of the top of my head why you might want to do this, but you know, that gives you an idea of how the, it gives you an idea of how these things are implemented, these dates and lists and numbers versions, they're all implemented by doing, doing this. So, that's more or less come to an end of that. So before I move on to this, that's basically covered all of those things to do with uh, swing and so on. So there's a lot of different elements and they, they map on to different kinds of data in, in, in Java in, in various different ways. So, just a five or ten minutes now, let's talk about the second assessment. So, how did you find the first assessment? What was it like? Right? Yeah. Yeah. What was challenging about it or all of it? None of it? A lot of it. A lot of it. <laughs> what 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 bits particularly? Was it about understanding the code or the bits you had to do or design patterns? Okay. Yeah. So uh, Actually, thinking about how to how to how to reorganise the code and so on. So, assessment two, that's been put on the Moodle page now for this module. So, if you if you look at that now, then you'll see the assessment two. Um, <coughs> we'll just spend a few minutes looking at it now. If we've got any immediate questions, we can talk about them now. So, the basic task, and this is again relatively open-ended. Is you know is to add some kind of graphical user interface to the game. So there are two primary tasks, and this you know I've basically left that as as the task. But there are two primary tasks to do here. At the moment, it's all text-based interface, yeah. So the first thing is to think about the actions. So remember, that there's a number of actions you can choose which are indicated by words. So the idea is you'll have a graphical user interface and these actions will be represented by um, buttons and you know sliders and boxes and text and whatever you think is relevant to the game. So you know the idea is that all the actions should be controllable from within some kind of graphical user interface. And then the second thing is to use this Java 2D thing that we were looking at the other week to add in some simple visualization of the current location of the player. So at basic to have some kind of visualization of the current location, where the exits are, and <coughs> what items are in that, that room. And then there's a, f a few additional marks available for adding some more elements to that interface. So if we go on to the Moodle page, um, let's see if it's still up here. 